Chronicles, Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Strike, I'll get that by the end of the sermon, won't I? And we're going to read the first 19 verses. And if you want to get a copy of the Bible study booklets or the household devotions, there are still copies up the back. And our memory verse is verses 24 to 25, which we'll look at next week. Jude, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago, have come in by stealth. They're ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Now, I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he's kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority and slander glorious ones. Yet when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, He did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they do not understand. And what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they're destroyed. Woe to them, for they've gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam's error for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion." These people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts as they eat with you without reverence. They're shepherds who only look after themselves. They're waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead, uprooted. They're wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied. Look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts they've done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers, living according to their desires, Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you, in the end time, there'll be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you open your newsletters, you'll find uh, what I could call a fairly fulsome outline there on the left-hand side. Uh, And on the top right-hand side, you've got some household questions so that you can have a chinwag about this over lunch later on in the day. Uh, Kids, if you get through the activity sheets quickly or you can multitask, I want you to keep count of how many times I use the word fight or fighting. I want you to keep track of that one word. Adults, if you're struggling with the outline, you can do the same, okay? Uh, You can follow along that way. Uh, Not many people like fighting. Not many people tell me as I talk to them about who they are and what they like doing, not many people say, I love a good fight. It's not something many people enjoy, though some of us will do it. A conflict or fighting, something that most of us run away from, And perhaps that is why no one has ever told me that Jude is their most favourite book in the Bible. Because Jude is about having a fight and about fighting for the faith. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into it together. Our Father, thanks for your word. 
Uh, it's terrific to see it here, a cool breeze coming through the windows, surrounded by brothers and sisters of every age. Uh, it's terrific to sit here and open your word. It's living and it's active. Uh, it's the means by which you transform us, taking us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, changing our postcode. Uh, Father, we're dealing today with uh, fighting. Uh, we don't like conflict and that is good. But Father, you remind us in your word that we are to fight for the faith once for all handed down. Uh, Father, help us as we look at these first 19 verses of Jude to know the enemy, to know the fight, and to have some principles by which to fight. Father, please apply these words to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, let me be very clear. Uh, as I said in the kids' talk, Jude is written by Jude. That's right. He's one of the four brothers of Jesus, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And notice as he kicks it off, he doesn't ride on the coattails of his famous brother. Did you notice that? Uh, he identifies himself with one of the other brothers of Jesus, James, who's leading the early church. But he is very modest about his family connections. He doesn't name drop, does he? Uh, he's writing to God's people. That's all we know about them. Uh, he gives them a description that is fairly reassuring there in verse 1. Uh, they're people God has called. They're his mob. God is their father who loves them. And God's going to keep them. So on the last day, a day we're going to hear a, a number of times about, on that last day, Jesus goes, you're my people. You're my household. Uh, the timing of the letter is completely unknown. We can only guess, but when you open another letter in the New Testament called 2 Peter, you'll find that there are a lot of similarities. Uh, Peter died before AD 70, and so we reckon that Jude was probably written sometime between AD 40 and AD 70. That's really precise, isn't it? The context of the letter is really hard to work out. So we've got an author, Jude, the brother of Jesus. We've got a group, God's people. We've got a time somewhere in that 30 to 40 years where, when, what was going on in the wider world, we, we're not really given any hints, are we? But we do know this. Whoever received the letter knows their Old Testament really well. Jude is constantly touching on the Old Testament. And he actually says in verse 5, you already know this stuff. And not only that, he also touches on a whole lot of extra books. Kind of like those devotional books, kind of like the books we have by J.I. Packer and Don Carson and Max Licato. Okay, extra stuff. And he quotes them because his people are familiar with them. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little later. So that's what we've got with the basics. Jude, a brother of Jesus, writes to God's mob who God loves and will keep until Jesus welcomes them home. We don't know the geography, we don't know the specific time. But we do know these people know their Bibles. Thankfully, we do know the purpose of the letter. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse three. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write, uh, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth, they're ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. I've never written a letter to a brother or sister in Jesus about our common salvation of you. Just a letter devoted to how good Jesus is, how good his good news is. But that's what Jude wanted to do. That was his original intention. I want to write to you about how good Jesus is. But you notice the circumstances have changed. Uh, necessity. Necessity often intervenes. And so the purpose of the letter has changed. It's now a letter about having a fight. Did you see that there in verse 3? Appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. Oh, we don't use the word contend, do we? Where We understand the word fight a lot better. <laughs> fight. Fight. It's an uncomfortable call. It's a confronting call. Uh, it's a necessary call, so necessary that Jude has changed the whole purpose of his letter. It's not about having a fight because you like a fight. 
It's not about having a fight so you can deal with those you don't like. It's not about having a fight because we like violence or conflict or contention. It's a fight for something. For the salvation, the good news, the faith that was delivered once for all to God's mob. There's something worth defending. There's something worth defending. It's called the faith. It's a body of truth that's handed down from generation to generation that brings people to, well, what is the faith? How would we define it? And that word handed down is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. And there, the bloke writing that letter, a bloke called Paul, gives us a very simple five-finger definition. We've just reminded ourselves of it, haven't we? Our Christ died, was buried and rose for our sins according to the Scriptures. The faith is the body of truth that tells us about Jesus. It's the body of truth that says... You're God's enemies. You've got a problem called sin. I in the middle or I can do a better job than God. And this is the only way war with God will finish. It's the body of truth that says forgiveness, reconciliation, dealing with your universal destination of death, you can only do that in Jesus Christ alone. It's the body of truth that says you don't earn it, but God gives it. You don't warrant it, but God loves you so much that he sent his boy to you. It's the body of truth that gathers all of those people connected to Jesus into a mob, a community, a household, a living temple, the body of Jesus, where Jesus is both the head and the foundation, and it's under threat. Did you see who's threatening it there in verse 4? Just look at verse 4. For some people are literally in the Greek men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They're ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. Uh, I didn't have a television in the 1980s. Uh, but I always made sure that I read the guide on Mondays in the Sydney Morning Herald. We got the paper delivered every day. So I got my popular culture and television watching through the guide. Uh, there was a show in the 80s called V. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever watched it. Uh, but V is a really, uh, it's not a show you really want to watch to relax. But at the heart of V is a group of people who look just like us. They talk like humans, they act like humans, they're in all the human jobs. They live just like us, but underneath, when you rip the disguise away, they're human-eating lizards that want to take over the world. They're slippery people, just like these men. Isn't it noticeable in the Bible that whenever you get God's mob taken away from God, there's some slithering involved, something slippery that's what these men are like. They're slippery little suckers who've come in by stealth. They look like God's people. They talk like God's people. They have jobs amongst God's people. They use the same language as God's people. They go to potluck dinners with God's people. They're part of your Bible study groups as God's people. They even have the Lord's Supper with God's people. But they're dangerous. And did you see in verse 4 how they're identified? There's three markers. They deny Jesus as boss. Put simply, they want Jesus and all of his benefits, but they don't want his commands. They want Jesus and his sacrifice, but they don't want his kingship. In our culture today, they want him as saviour, but don't dare say he's your Lord. They're profoundly rebellious against Jesus being boss. Secondly, these people abuse the grace of God. They pervert it. They turn it into an excuse. And isn't this such a great word? It captures what it is. They turn it into an excuse for sensuality. God is a God of love. He's a God of grace. So I can do what I want because i got a blank check of forgiveness. 
I can do whatever I want because God is the God of love and he'll always forgive me. Do you notice that they take God's grace and take its forgiveness but they reject its transformation? And they say, God's my loving father who will let me do whatever I want and then forgive me. And because of those two, they're profoundly ungodly. They deny at heart the essence of being God's people. And they don't want to represent God. They want to indulge their own heart. They don't want Jesus on the throne. They're quite happy sitting on the throne. But they want all the benefits. There's been many attempts to name and shame these people, to put a label on the false teaching. But as we go through this letter, and Ben will finish it off next week, uh, you'll notice that we never get a very clear description of their theology but we get a very clear description of their behaviour. It's a warning to God's people that what you do reflects your doctrine. (laughs) How you behave shows what you believe. What you practice is really what you proclaim. And so if we want to identify these people who are so slippery and stealthy, we look at how they live. Because how they live shows who their Lord is. So you can summarise it, summarise it like this. God's my gracious and loving Father and he'll just forgive anything I want to do so I can do whatever I want to do and always be saved. And Jesus, well, he's my saviour but he better not tell me what to do. They've slithered in and they're starting to send this teaching out amongst God's people and Jude says... Fight for the faith. Fight for the faith. So how are we going to fight? How does fighting look? What are the principles for warfare, if you like? And the next section from verses 5 to 19 maps that out. So I'm at point four on the outline. And the next section is five shorter parts. And Jude gives us some principles for fighting. Principles for fighting so we understand who we're fighting against and what we're fighting for. Uh, As we go into this, and I'm going to move through this next section very quickly. As we go into this, let me make three very simple observations. Each of the five sections looks the same. So verses 5 to 8, you'll see them there on your outline. 5 to 8, 9 to 10, 11 to 13, 14 to 16, 17 to 19. And in each of them, Jude touches on something historical and then applies it to these blokes. Each section works the same. Something historical from God's people then applied to these people. Uh, Secondly, notice that Jude talks about some books that aren't in the Bible. Uh, He does it a number of times because that would have been normal for his readers. They knew their Old Testament and they were very devout in reading other books about the Bible. Now, don't, don't go, this is the third observation, don't go down the rabbit holes. Notice that Jude is doing this to make a point. And when he makes a point from those extra biblical books, he never goes beyond the Bible. He just uses them to make a point. So so please don't get distracted. All the sections look the same, history, application. Jude uses some extra biblical books and the Bible to make a point. Stay focused. So we're going to try and do that. And the first section is there in verses 5 to 8. Look there in verse 5 at how he starts off. Now, I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, I want to remind you, you know your Bible so well. Could you ask the same question of us? Could you say where Balaam is or who Balaam is? Korah? Cain? Those angels described a little earlier on, Sodom and Gomorrah, where God's people are judged and wiped out for a generation. Could you actually pick the parts that aren't in the Bible but Jude uses? How well do you know your Bible? The first reminder is from Numbers 14. God saved his people out of Egypt. God said, you're my mob, Mount Sinai. You've got a job to do. Let me take you to the land you're going to do the job in. They get to the border of the land and 
They send some spies in, 12 of them. Ten say, oosh, too hard. Two say, let's go. Don't you remember what God's done? And God, as their father, says, you doubt me? Do you remember the plagues? Do you remember the Red Sea? Do you remember the salvation, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? Do you remember Mount Sinai? I'm going to wipe out that generation that presumed on my grace. And he does. Second example is from Genesis 6 where God's angels step out of heaven and decide to sleep with the daughters of men. They overstep the boundaries that God had set. And Jewish tradition said that God chained them up so that on judgment day he would annihilate them. The third reminder is from Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's become a byword even in our culture, hasn't it? of what happens when you take the very good design of God and pervert it. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? It's a tar pit. God judges the rebellious, the arrogant and the proud who think they know better than God, even amongst his own people. So look at verse 8. In the same way, these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority and slander glorious ones. Slippery little suckers who go, I dreamt this, so I'm going to do this. And they pervert the grace of God. They despise the glorious beings, Jesus on his throne. And they do whatever they want with God's design. And that little snapshot from history tells us what God does with these people. They will be judged. A second example, verses 9 to 10, and we get a section from an extra biblical book. It's a really funky story, isn't it? Uh, it it's kind of captures your mind. Can you imagine uh, the archangel Michael, who's the leader of all of God's army, book of Revelation, and the devil standing on either side of the body of Moses? Because they're debating about Moses, because uh, what was he in Egypt? He was a murderer, wasn't he? <laughs> Is this guy fit for God's presence? Uh, It's from a book called The Assumption of Moses. It sounds very similar to Zechariah 3. And do you notice what the archangel Michael refuses to do with the devil? If anyone in all the universe has the right to tell the devil to rack off, it's at least the commander of God's armies. But he doesn't do that, does he? That's God's job. God will deal with you, Satan. God will deal with you. But these men, look at verse 10. What do these men do? But these people blaspheme anything they do not understand and what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they're destroyed. They're so arrogant. Have you ever struck someone like this? They're so arrogant that they have no clue about something but they'll profess a very learned opinion about it. Uh, It's one of my temptations most days of the week. They blaspheme the things they don't know. But the things they do know, their lust and their money and their bank accounts and their pride, they'll indulge those and those very things they do know will destroy them and lead them to direct judgment. Third chunk, verses 11 to 13, back to the Old Testament. Very snappy verse here in verse 11. Summarises a huge chunk. Woe to these people because they follow Cain. Genesis 4, We we know all about Cain, don't we? Cain gave free reign to his desires. And what did it lead to? He slaughtered his brother. Slaughtered his brother and and God banished him. But Jewish tradition actually says that once he was banished, he then set up a city where you could go to that city because that was a city known for being sceptical about God. That was a city you could go to to indulge your desires and doubt the judgment of God. These blokes are following Cain. And then he turns to Balaam, Numbers 22 to 24. Balaam? Balaam's the bloke who was a prophet for profit. He was a mouthpiece for God who would say what you wanted from God to the highest bidder. And God dealt with him, didn't he? With his donkey. But Balaam became a byword for indulgence of desires and selling 
the word of God for prophet. Korah, he's the third, number 16. He led a rebellion against the leadership of God's people. And on that day, Moses said, you decide, and the people decided, and Korah, the whole earth opened up and swallowed him and his people. And look how he applies it in verse 12. Remember, a bit of history, application. These people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts as they eat with, eat with you without reverence. They're shepherds who only look after themselves, waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead, uprooted. They're wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the darkness, the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Have you ever spoken about someone in those terms? Brutal, isn't it? It's blunt. He doesn't hold back. He's not backward in coming forward. They sit at your Lord's supper meals. That's the love feast. They share food with you. They talk about grace and sacrifice and love. They talk about Jesus and God. And what are they? They're going to rip a hole in your boat and they're going to sink you. They're reefs. Notice the other descriptions there, self-centred shepherds. They're good shepherds to have, aren't they? Meant to guard the sheep, but they sacrifice the sheep and eat them. They're waterless clouds. They promise so much and they deliver nothing. They're trees that are twice dead. Not only do they shed their leaves at autumn, but they're rotten at the core. Only good for firewood. They're waves that rear up and all you can see, have you, ever, have you ever noticed that at nighttime when you're down at the beach? All you can see as a wave comes is just the froth at the top. And so you know them by their deeds, but they're empty underneath. And they're stars that wander the universe headed for darkness, empty but dangerous, headed for destruction. Fourth one, verses 14 to 16, turns to another extra, extra biblical book, One Enoch. Uh, one Enoch, there's a prophecy that says God will bring judgment and match what these people say in their deeds together and destroy them. Just like these people, verse 16, a discontented grumblers living according to their desires, mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. What they proclaim and what they practice go hand in hand and reveal them as being dangerous dangerous and finally verses 17 to 19 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 these men were to be expected it was always going to be like this and they will only cause division so there you go a cook's tour of the bible five sections some history some application Jude, the brother of Jesus, has written a 25-verse letter to God's people and said, go and have a fight. Fight for the faith. Christ died, buried, rose for your sins according to the Scriptures because there's slippery little suckers who've come in and you can identify them and you must fight for the faith because they abuse God's grace, they deny the Lordship of Jesus and they're destined for judgment. And we wouldn't have a situation like that in our church, would we? The Archbishop of Canterbury has just approved the appointment of a new dean for Canterbury Cathedral who is in a long-term same-sex relationship. A large number of English bishops have just released a statement after their week-long bishops conference saying that the Anglican Church is so out of step with the world that we must update our theology or become irrelevant. There are dioceses within Australia which now have on the books marriage services that give the thumbs up to marriages that do not accord with God's design. One of the leading theologians of the Melbourne Diocese has publicly stated and publicly written that same-sex marriage is a clear expression of God's design for love in Genesis. And the Archbishop of Perth at her recent diocesan synod avoided every question about expecting faithfulness in morality from those who led God's people. Even in our own diocese, we have had an instance of which we are all aware where it is okay to play music and live in active rebellion against God because God is a God of grace. 
That sounds like Jude, doesn't it? But it's not just out there in the wider church. It can also happen to any community of God's people where we say that God is a God of grace and nothing else that that grace can be presumed upon, abused and treated lightly, where Jesus is my saviour, but don't he dare think he can change my life. And the result of this is a profoundly ungodly lifestyle where lust and lucre become the norm. So how are we going to fight? There are some principles there, and I'll finish with these very quickly. First, fight for the faith. Don't fight for your hobby horses. Don't fight for your personal vendettas. Don't fight because you like a fight. Fight for the faith. The once for all handed down truth that Jesus Christ lived, died and rose from our sins so we could be forgiven and reconciled to God. Fight for that. Second, fight with knowledge. The best boxes box here. The best soccer players play here. The best cricketers play here. It begins with your thinking, what you know and hold in your heart. And the measure is there in verse 5. Surely you know all this. Uh, Do we? And familiarity with this, the word of God, has a purpose because we know the faith and we can identify the enemy. It's at least reading your Bible daily and praying about it. It might, I suggest, should extend into being part of a regular Bible study group where you spend time in community reading God's word together. Perhaps it might even extend into some theological study. Third, fight in humility. That is one of the hallmarks of these men is their arrogance. Uh, That arrogance can go one of two ways. On the one hand, it can say, I know better than God, and we we tend to do that. On the other, it can be a false humility. God is so mysterious. How could I ever say what he is like? That's arrogant because you've just dismissed a whole bunch of books that say what he thinks. Fight humbly. Fight humbly. There's a boss, his name is Jesus, and he proved it by dying for you. Fight humbly. Don't ignore the very clear words of God. Principle four, fight with confidence. Did you notice how they're described in verse four? These slippery little suckers. They've been destined for judgment from long ago. The outcome's sorted. Remember when John Howard sent us a whole bunch of fridge magnets that said, be alert and not alarmed? Jess is shaking her head. She wasn't that old. Uh, But that's what we're meant to be. Be alert. Don't be alarmed. We know the outcome. Don't be apathetic. It's under control. Fifthly, fight realistically. (laughs) They're always going to come. They're always going to come. Here to Narrabride, they'll come. Here to Australia, they'll come. Here within that great denomination called Anglicanism, they're here. Be realistic. And finally, beware. Did you notice that this whole letter is to God's people about God's people? People who treated the grace of God lightly and presumed upon it. People who showed in their actions what they truly believed. Do you hear the warning? The book of Jude. Let's go and have a fight for the faith. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, We've spent a lot of time in it and there's been a lot of info that's come bouncing at us. Uh, Father, give us time this week to spend in your word in these 19 verses so that we will fight for the faith. Thanks for Jesus. He is worth fighting for. Amen. Any quick questions? Two. Well, the young'uns, let's go, we'll go left to right. Actually, no, we'll, we'll, we'll go over here to Miss Bennett. Yes, Elsie. Why did you use, uh, why did you, instead of using fighting for a lot of conflict? Conflict. 
Uh, no, it wasn't to confuse you, but they're part of all the same word group, aren't they? Contend, fight, conflict. I'm 41. 41. Gee whiz, all right. All right, we'll see how I go in the next one. But that's a good question. I didn't do it on purpose. I just, you put 20 cents in and off I go. Baxter, back, wait a sec, Kels. If we're to be aware of these people yep. receiving in our church, how do we try and pull you to mind? <laughs> because we want them to come to know about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And, but we also want to kind of push them out so that they don't affect the church. So how do we do it while still trying to maintain their love Back, so that is a corker question. How do we deal with these people, protect ourselves, but also bring them to Jesus? Do you know what? That's verses 20 to 25. That's next week, okay? But l- let me give you a hint. So today what we've done is here's the cause. Here are the principles next week. This is what it looks like in practice, okay? And it is, it is terrific. Read ahead, but the key thing is keep yourself in God's love so you can fight with love. And that's one of the key ideas.